Psalm 34, verse 8, gives us an instruction from God. He says, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Then he says this, blessed is the man, the woman, the boy, the girl who takes refuge in the Lord. That's why we're turning to the word of God. We're taking refuge in the Lord and we're tasting and we're going to see that the Lord our God is good. Precious Heavenly Father, we turn to you. We turn to your word and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege we have of access to your precious Holy Spirit. We never want to take that for granted, Lord. He is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the reverential awe of the living God. And we believe we receive Holy Spirit's help right now on assignment, unfolding the treasure map of life so that we can be united in Christ Jesus. Amen. Say amen. Thank God. Praise God. We're in this series, United, and what an amazing time. What a coincidence to be talking about such a powerful aspect of God's Word, being united in Christ Jesus at this time in history, when there's so much difficulty, so much turmoil, so much division, we get to focus on God's Word and be united in Christ Jesus. We're on part three of this series. In this segment, we're going to specialize on your destiny. Yes, your destiny. Praise God. First, let's review what we've already learned in parts one and two. From Genesis 11, we get the story of the Tower of Babel. God gives us his perspective on this rebellious plan by humans that unlimited potential is available to us when we're united. And that's for good or, as the Tower of Babel people saw, for evil. There is healthy unity, but there is very destructive dark unity. I've seen good people in an ungodly alliance scratching their head at the troubles that have overtaken their life. They don't understand the biblical standard of right or wrong cohesion. There is right and there is wrong cohesion. Psalm 34 verse 14 says, depart from evil. We've got to leave evil. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, bad company ruins good morals. 2 Corinthians 6 17 says, so come out from among unbelievers and be separate, says the Lord. That's not says Stephen, it's says the Lord. God is giving us counsel in this New Testament age of grace on how to live in his grace. After all, grace is not an excuse for evil behavior, but rather it's empowerment, it's wisdom and direction to be united for a blessed destiny. We learn that two atoms of hydrogen activated with one atom of oxygen, that cohesion is water, life-giving water. How about if you take corrosive iron ore, fire it with carbon, you have the alloy steel, some of the most non-corrosive strong building material in the world. This unity of elements is the reason that we have skyscrapers and all other kinds of modern marvels. Part one and two of this series, United, help us realize that unity comes in two basic brands, the good stuff and the evil stuff. There is true unity and corrupt evil unity that is destructive. We're interested in the good stuff, aren't we? That promotes God's power and his outcomes here on earth as it is in heaven. United, part three, your destiny. You heard me use the term true unity, but God gives us an even better qualifier for unity. When God's word talks about equipping and edifying the body of believers, it says this in Ephesians 4 verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith. Understand this, there's a unity that's born out of faith, of faith. Faith in God produces powerful unity that moves the hand of God. It even affects stuff, things. Oh, but Pastor Stephen, what does faith have to do with cohesion for things like water and steel? Well, who do you think made the hydrogen, the oxygen atom? Who hid iron in the earth? Or who is the original designer of the chemical element carbon? It's God. 
Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And we just read that there is a unity that's of faith. Faith in God produces unity. When you remove faith in the truth from the principle of unity, then you're left with corruption. For example, if you care more about pleasing your neighbor than pleasing God, your version of unity will be void of life, void of truth, and therefore it'll corrupt easily. As good as it seems today, it will only rot tomorrow. The unity of the faith is a cohesion based on eternal truth and principle, not on preferences or opinions. Opinion cannot save you or your children from sickness or corruption. Faith in God can. Our unity to God's truth, in spite of our background and our traditions, that is the unity of faith. Unity is an outcome of faith. This is sounding like an essential part of your destiny, isn't it? In my years of experience ministering to many diverse groups of believers, I've found that focusing on the Bible reality of Jesus, it unites us. Not talking about our differences. Christ's blood unites us, not a genetic bloodline. That separates us, and trusting in our blood can destroy our heavenly destiny. We overcome, the Bible says, by the blood of the Lamb, not our nationality or our gender or our culture. If the flesh could add to the work of Christ in achieving a new identity, then God would bless a hybrid identity. But God does not bless hybrid identity. We call it monster identity. The book of Galatians rips that idea apart. Unity of faith, some call it revival, it follows after repentance. Repentance sets us up for unity, cohesion, harmony, not sameness, but God-like steel kind of harmony. Without change, without alignment, repentance, corruption is inevitable. Paul Harvey, the late great radio personality and philosopher, he said this, Rome fell apart because within it had decayed and degenerated morally, socially, and economically to where, like an angry scorpion, it turned on itself and died of its own sting. Wow, what an amazing quote. Now look around. Society, with all of its so-called efforts to fix itself, is instead cannibalizing itself. It devours its young. It's vulnerable. Have you ever seen a home with termite infestation? At a distance, everything looks fine, but when you get up close, you see the wooden support beams that stabilize the house are porous, they're rotten. Termites like to eat the wood from the inside out. Right now, we don't have to look too hard to see that society has a serious case of immoral termite infestation. The world is desperate to project this sanitized veneer or fake unity, but it's weak, it's rotten, it's corrupt. Let's remind ourselves of how we started off this series with the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Remember, the elite society was all about pursuing a form of unity by building up, right? That's how we do it. We try to build something together, to look together. Priority is on the appearance. They were drawing the people inward with a building, a tower upward. In verse 6, God saw that they were one people with one language with one plan. God said that that cohesion, this alloy, would make it so anything they imagined would be possible to them. That's what God said about them. Think about that. God himself said their unity, their fusion of being one people plus one language plus one plan would equal no limits, nothing impossible to them. And yet it was an evil plan, corruption, and interfering with God's even way better great destiny. Your destiny is what we're talking about today. And it is the result of, yes, the outcome of faith. Counterfeiting a fake kind of unity to coerce your own destiny is anti-God. It's the antithesis of true faith. It's a form of Truth treason. You may chant unity, you may sing unity, but it's evil at its core. The people of the Tower of Babel pursued a unity rooted in truth treason. 
when God actually wanted so much more. His plan was so much better for them. The leaders were probably afraid of losing control of the communication network and therefore losing control over the people, over the crowd. So their compromise and truth treason against God cost them everything. They even lost control of their own tongues, if you can imagine. Imagine they would no longer read the instructions on their favorite shopping website. They couldn't do it. Their fake unity imploded. They were unfaithful to God, and so their united front became a garbage dump. <laughs> Just like a group of insecure people at a point of decision, right? Procrastinators unite tomorrow. Here's the thing about being united. The fusion of being one people plus one communication plus one plan reveals the power inherent in our God-like design. In Genesis 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. But a few verses later, he said, it's not good or profitable for man to be alone. Now, why? Why did he say that? Because the gift of increase, the gift of more expansion is expressed through our unity. Look at Matthew 18, verse 19, where Jesus says this. He says, again, I say to you that if two believers on earth, that is, are of one mind in harmony about anything that they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Notice that God's power is activated with as few as just two people, but united. They've got to be united. Your spiritual agreement, your true unity actually obligates the hand of Father God on your behalf in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus said on the matter. That should excite us, but at the same time, it should help convict and convince us that it's time to get serious about being biblically united. There is a great Ethiopian proverb that says, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. Martin Luther King Jr. once famously said this, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. So we know, we are convinced that being united is key to life, building, to success. The question is, what's the cause? What's the plan? What coalition or unity is right for you? Do you know? Do you know where you belong? What's your destiny? To whom do you belong? You see, the reality of your destiny is determined by your unity, your unity in God's family. My friend, your destiny is ultimately the outcome of faith. Yes, I know you want to hear that again. The reality of your destiny is decided by your unity in God's family. United, our hope is in the Lord. United, praise God forevermore. God has set us free, indivisible will be. United, trusting in the Lord, we stand united. The problem with the people of Genesis 11 is that they wanted to customize their destiny. They wanted to utilize a public unity for their own selfish benefit, but a unity not of faith. God called humanity to possess the world, but they wanted to park in a valley and paint sunsets. God has a call on your life, my friend, a destiny, and it's bigger than you can imagine, but it requires you being united in his family, his body of envoys, ambassadors, representing King Jesus. God the Father has a family, a family name, and it constitutes his house. Many sons and daughters of all backgrounds, creeds, colors, ages, but all one blood, Jesus DNA. Destiny is the outcome of our faith. That's your destiny. The moment I hear someone call themselves a Christian but emphasize their own genetics, I hear warning bells go off. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, his bloodline is preeminent, period. I said his bloodline, Jesus' bloodline is preeminent. We arrive at unity in the body of Christ if and when we address our sinful nature, let go of our original birth and are born again. That means born again into a new identity, a new citizenship, citizens of God's eternity. 
Seriously, though, how can you live the new life if you don't repent? Change your citizenship. You can try to champion your old identity based on genetics, accomplishment, gender, culture, but that would be denying the citizenship available through Jesus' death and resurrection. He died so that we can be set free from our old citizenship, our old self. Jesus was resurrected so that we would have legal right to be born again, to be new citizens as a whole new creation in Christ Jesus. That's beautiful. Why would you hold on to a sinful old identity, a broken identity, a Genesis 11 Babel identity? Demanding your rights over his rightness is aborting your destiny, your true identity. Listen again. Your destiny is the outcome of faith. That means it's dependent on what God does for us and dependent on our trust in that work. It's a unity in our heart with God's identity through a trust in him, a faith in him, a unity of faith. Ninia Campbell, a novelist, she once wrote this, identities are like teeth, hard to maintain and easy to lose, but people tend to look at you funny when you're missing one. So good. So everyone is in a scramble to get an identity, but the problem is your identity is your unity in God's family. And that, my friend, truly is your eternal identity, your destiny. In the story of Cinderella, destiny is revealed on the other side of repenting of her old identity, right? When the prince sees her as the princess and not as a poor servant girl, then destiny ignites. Until there is a letting go of her old identity, there can be no unity in the royal family. Jesus called to Peter's destiny by recognizing him as, quote, the rock, and on this rock, I will build my church. Luke 6, 48, Jesus said that listening and acting on his word of truth is like building your house upon a foundation of rock so that when the storm comes, your life will stand strong. God has already designed your destiny. He's an expert builder. He is the expert builder. You've got a place in his family. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, Come and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house. God does that work. You are a living stone, a precious life, uniquely of God's design. God wants you united into his house, his family, his destiny of family power benefits. Oh, that's so good. He wants you activated in love and by love. Talking about destiny. A little five-year-old girl told her mom, I'm going to marry Justin. Mom asks, why? The five-year-old says, well, he's really good looking and I like his shirt. I like his shirt. Mom goes, looks aren't everything, dear. The daughter replies, well, he, he likes to clean up too. Mom pauses for just a second. She goes, sweetie, you need to lock that in real fast. (laughs) So let's talk further about the reality of destiny in good unity, that unity of the faith. Part of the biblical art of being united is knowing who to walk with and whom you should not walk with. Oh, Pastor Stephen, as a Christian, I don't believe in avoiding anyone. Really? Jesus did, so are you better than him? Culture promotes a we-are-the-world feel-good ideology. Let's all have just a big group hug and then everything will be all right. But that's not reality. That's not truth or what the Bible teaches. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, verse 16, Look, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise. John Lennon had a popular song he wrote with these lyrics. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. You see, that's an unconscious oblivion. It's an arrogant assumption that we don't have a sin problem. He's saying Cain would have not murdered his brother Abel if only there were no countries. What? What? 
Sin, sickness, and death are never remedied by looking the other way or compromise. You hear mobs in the street demanding wholesale amnesty for a class of criminal, but that's a convenient offering when it's not your daughter getting raped and you're not going to lift a finger to pay the price to ransom the victim. You see, God is full of mercy for broken humanity, but, but he pays the price for the sin, for our sin. The problem or the crime must, it must be dealt with or the disease metastasizes. Do you understand what that means? That means it gets worse. It spreads. It takes over every aspect of your life and therefore every aspect of humanity. Yes, God recognizes and calls out the enemy of your destiny, but he also has paid the price to ransom you from being under the control of the curse. Under the control of the disease, he ransoms us. God thought that you were worth saving and solving the sin problem. That's why he sent Jesus. Proverbs 18, verse 24. The man of many friends, a friend of all the world, will prove himself a bad friend. Unity is not some group hug we just hand out randomly, but an order we practice with God's wisdom. It requires repentance, turning to wisdom and skill to really have true unity. Until we take responsibility for our zero unity with God, we cannot authorize His forgiveness in our life. You need to take responsibility. Anybody in the AA program knows that you've got to own it. Take responsibility to start the journey to recovery. Blaming others deprives you of any authority and further divides your soul into many fractured pieces. Be united in God's love. CEOs get paid a lot of money to guide their company into a unity that makes them profitable. Professional sports hire coaches for millions of dollars who bring strategic change to achieve team unity. History is full of examples of where it's not the biggest who wins, but the unity of faith, that's who wins. In my series, True Grit, I talk about forging steel. The importance of unique elements forged together in extreme heat and compression. Simple, diverse elements are made into an alloy with amazing strength, flexibility, anti-corrosive quality, and great potential. It's not just about you being fused into the right family, but also you being the right person. Trying to be with the right people is not a substitute for being the right person. How does that happen? Well, we know the Bible says that we're all born into sin. We need help being. Jesus came to help us be. We must let him save us. That's existential faith. So the answer is simple. Repent. Change your thinking. Be directed to your destiny. Look, let's get real honest here. Without true repentance, a letting go of what was, you'll never realize the power of being truly united. I just mentioned that to make steel, you must heat up elements to an extreme temperature, compress them to an extreme level. Then you get a new birth, a reborn or born again alloy from that unity. But make no mistake, my friend, the heat and the fire provoke a change, a repentance, a letting go of who they were, what they were. Your destiny is on the other side of what was. Think about what the fire does. It makes the element humble, willing, surrendered, purified. To repent is to change your thinking, to return. What do we return to? Truth, yes. God's absolutes, his straight edge of morality, yes. But even more specifically, Jesus' cross, God's plan. Romans 7 is a whole chapter on how his death delivers from the law of sin and death. Repentance has got a bad taste for many people because it's been so misused. Wrong tone. Jesus didn't run around screaming repent. He announced it as the life-saving opportunity. Repent. Mark 1 verse 15. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Have a change of mind, which issues in regret for the past sins and in a change of conduct for the better. And believe, trust and rely and adhere to the good news, the gospel. You see, Jesus was pointing the way to your destiny, your new identity. 
The Winter Olympics of 1980 are famous for what's called the miracle on ice. The U.S. hockey team shocked the world by beating the undefeated Russians to win gold. Coach Herb Brooks said this in his locker room speech just before the game. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what you have here tonight, boys. The movie starred Kurt Russell, and there's a moving part in the story where Coach Brooks intensifies the training to an unbearable physical breaking point. More than just physical training, he was trying to strip the old lesser identity out of the guys to unite them into the greater one-team identity, one-team name. Are you getting the subtle comparison here of letting go of your old identity to be engrafted into your heavenly ID? The Bible says that in Christ, you have a new name, a new identity, and it's written down in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. I'm not going to avoid the issue. Depression, anxiety, sadness, hopelessness, they're epidemic today. From the poor to the rich, from the young to the old, people are suffering. The challenge is knowing what you're suffering from. Most don't understand it's their old identity that's dragging them down. Am I saying the answer is just being united? No, because the with whom factor must be answered. If you don't repent, you will take your inner reality, your inner crazy into a union and it will multiply. Unions have the power to multiply, so repent first. Lay down all the sin, the sadness at the cross of Christ. That's repenting. Take responsibility and humble yourself by submitting to Jesus' victory. Winston Churchill once famously said, when there is no enemy within, the enemies outside cannot hurt you. Mr. Churchill was pointing at United Part 2, being personally united in our heart. Society says, if we can make everything right outside, then you'll finally feel right inside. That's a lie. It's meant to distract you from your need of repenting from your own sin. Again, blame someone else for everything that's wrong. You've lost because he won. That ideology will only get you united to a bunch of crazy activists marching off the cliff of oblivion. If only life can be someone else's fault, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be free, able to move on into unity. Look, if your life is everyone else's fault, then you are completely powerless to be redeemed. Jesus came to give us power over the enemy within. Fear destroys from within. Envy kills from within. Anger, hate, jealousy, lust, depression, hopelessness, all destroys from within. Repent, change your way of thinking, get your mess out and lay it at the feet of Jesus and then be united in Christ so that you can stand. You've been trying to fix your life by exporting the blame to everyone else and it hasn't worked, has it? Oh sure, you may feel better after you blast someone on Facebook or X for a minute or two, but you're still in the same mess. Your inner reality is still attracting all the crazy to the shores of your life. Repent. Jesus is saying, repent. You're needed. God is doing something amazing and it's in partnership with you. You're needed. Look, you are so important. You're needed. The call of God on your life is significant. You are irreplaceable. Not what you do, but who you are. You are irreplaceable. The reason the devil works so hard to make you feel worthless, unqualified, unfit, it's because he's terrified of you being hooked up with the right people, being united and living by faith. He is terrified of you receiving, growing, and being able to give. He has no defense against that coming from you. That's your destiny. United in Christ, you're an overcomer. That's your destiny. Imagine that. He has no defense against you when you're standing united in faith. James 4 says, the devil even runs when you resist him in faith. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9, be sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours, the devil roams about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Withstand him. Be firm where in faith. I know you want to stand firm in the unity of faith right now. Like Coach Brooks' speech, you see a great moment born from a great opportunity right now. Even though 
There are challenges everywhere. Your destiny is at hand. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, pray that out loud. Just say, Heavenly Father, I want to stand in the unity of faith. I repent. I let go of my thinking. Forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, you died on the cross. You rose up from the grave. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I'm on team Jesus now. He's my life coach. I'm united to the Savior in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.